Thank you all for coming. So, uh, as said, uh, I'm going to present the formal verification of the W3C web authentication protocol. So, user authentication has always been a problem in the research area by itself. A lot of, I think we all agree that passwords is an efficient technique for so many reasons. A lot of solution has been implemented. Unfortunately, none of them has reached the large market. Like, all these solutions, like I mentioned, and several more, they failed for so many reasons combined together. Like for example, TLS client certificates, even though it uses strong cryptographic primitives, the problem is once it's uh, on your browser, now we have at least two more devices, so we can't really, the portability of the certificates is not, it's basically impossible. Microsoft card space is a good solution, again, from a security perspective, however, it has so many features, and from a usability perspective, it, it didn't reach the user. Federated login now, a lot of users they use it, but we actually use, do we actually trust one server to deal with all our accounts? So there is a need for a new protocol for user authentic for user authentication. Therefore, a lot of large companies like Google and PayPal have been working together to develop this new protocol W3C. A little bit of background. So the W3C web authentication protocol is a mixture between phone off and the fiber specification. Phone off where we use our phone to give a strong cryptographic second factor. And fiber specification, the first one is universal authentication framework, where basically all either your PIN or biometric data is stored locally on your device, it's not on the server. And the universal second factor, the second factor is not the SMS, it's actually a, a cryptographic second factor. So what is this protocol? It's a protocol that ensures user, a strong user authentication with asymmetric cryptography. It prevents from phishing attacks, man-in-the-middle attacks, and the unlikability between users. Basically, each user has one authenticator, can be your key device, and he can have more. And each authenticator has an attestation key, which proves that he's actually an actual user with actual device. And then whenever the, the, whenever the user is trying to connect to another, to one server, the authenticator, the authenticator generates a different pair of keys for each server. It's a challenge response protocol, which basically is the server will, will send a challenge, usually in, in this protocol it's a NOS, and then the user will sign it, send it back to the, ch to the server, and the server will uh, verify the channel, and then either registration or authenticator, depending on the scenario. Sorry. So we have two cases. The first one is the registration, and the second one is the authentication. The authentication. The registration is when the user is trying to connect the first time, is trying to register his device. So the line party, which is the server, will send the challenge with his ID to the user, and then the authenticator would generate a new pair of keys and will associate that with the relying party. So he will only use it with this relying party. And then send the attestation certificate, which is basically the attestation pair of keys, the attestation public key, I'm sorry, and uh, the, the public key that he's gonna use the, with the relying party. The, the server will verify the signature, and then if it's fine, then the relying party will associate this public key with the user account. For the authentication, which is again a challenge, but now this, the user will only send the associated signature with his credential public key, which the public key that he generated earlier in the, uh, in the registration and associated with the relying party. The relying party will uh, verify the challenge and this, uh, the signature and let the user authenticate himself. So uh, to do the formal verification, we worked with Proverif. Proverif is an automatic tool under the symbolic model Dolevia. Why do we choose this tool, not another? Because we're, we're looking into the entire protocol. We don't look at the, 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 the primitives. And because we assume that these primitives are working fine, and because they actually this bank is using like very known primitives. And Dolevia, Dolevia let us do this. With Proverif, we can, so we can implement model encryption, signature, hash function, Diffie Helmut, and we can prove several properties like security, authentication, equivalence. So, this is the architecture of Proverif, and we write the model with PyCalculus. We have the property that we want to prove, and then once, the, once we run the protocol, it translates into horn clauses and see if the property holds or not. 
Uh, as we say, the, the, we, when, we, when we write the model, it, we write it in pi calculus, and then it will be translated into horn classes of all the phases of the protocol. So for our protocol, we have two different categories of properties. We have the security properties and the privacy properties. The security, of course, we're going to verify the authentication and integrity, which means that in our threat model, is the attacker is network attacker. It can block messages, can inject messages, can read the messages if you came to. And to do this with Proverif, for the integrity, we have the queries of the attacker, and we're going to verify this with all the messages that will translate where that will be between the server and the user. And for the authentication, we have this event, which is send challenge response and valid challenge response. The send challenge response is in the process of the user, and the valid challenge response is the process of the server. And when the authentication holds, it means that the first event will trigger directory in all phases of the protocol, the second, the second query, which is the valid challenge response. If there is one phase that this is uh, this the first event does not trigger directly or the message was uh, was changed this means that the authentication will not hold for the privacy property we have a bit of a problem what does it mean to be what does it mean privacy and what which, which definition definition of privacy in our model so we, we chose to work on the unlinkability because the protocol assumed that because you do use different pair of keys for each relying party it means that your accounts cannot be linked so the unlinkability we, uh, so we use the reachability, the attack, our threat model is the web attacker because you will see the messages that you will receive and see if you can link the users. And we use the reachability events, which means that if the attacker has um, the information from the web and you will see if these two accounts are linked, for example, the scenario we have either you as a user, you have one authenticator and you want to log in to your Facebook account with two different accounts, but you're going to use one authenticator. Theoretically, with this fact, you can do this and your accounts will not be linked because you're going to generate two pair of keys. However, in uh, or the second scenario, you're going to use one authenticator with two relying parties. You're going to connect to Facebook and Twitter, and you want to see if these two accounts are, li are linked or not. For this, we created a database that will say restore all the information that the first time during the registration you sent to register your device, and we will see if the attacker actually reached the same key or not. So these are the results of our protocol of our running model in Proverie. For the first one, we can see the, all, the, all the messages the attacker cannot read because we're using encryption. For the authenticator, result event triggered the second event, which is actually true, which means that the authenticator in all cases of, in all phases of this protocol holds. However, for the privacy, the, re, the result is false. And in this case, we have either malicious server or a server honest but curious and he will save a lot of information about the authenticator in the first phase and he will actually know that you're using the same authenticator which means that you are the same user with two different accounts. So what we propose to the FIDO specs is what if the, all the authenticator they will have the same attestation keys which means I can prove that I actually I am a real user, I actually bought the device, I have an actual device, but no one can know which user I am because all the users are using the same key. It's a good solution, however, it's easy to be hacked. If we can figure out how to develop the, the attestation keys, well, it's really easy. You don't, an attacker doesn't need to buy a lot of you the keys to, to create accounts. The second solution is the ECDA, Elliptic Curves Anonymous Attestation. And in this case, what, what the, the CDIA, it means that you will blindly sign to the server, that we need a verifier, an issuer, and you as a host, that you will require, that you will ask for from the sign, the, the issuer, that you will be uh, belonging to a group signature, and then you will sign your device, you will register your device, belonging to this group of signature. However, what if, the issuer, which is yubiki.com, and the verifier, which is facebook.com, are both corrupted and uh, they want to save the information. Actually, GAA, in, uh, that is implemented with the RSA, when the case of corrupted user uh, issuer and verifiers, we prove that the, the only capability between users cannot be whole. 
So now we have a new definition of privacy. In this case, what does it mean to be private? And our definition is an attacker cannot distinguish between two signatures because we belong to the same group of people who were give us the issue or give us to belong to this group uh, signature. So in this, we can translate it into observational equivalence in proof or eve. And what it means is that you have two processes, P and Q, and they are equivalent if the active attacker cannot distinguish between the two processes. Thank you very much. That was fast. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. <laughs> oh, sorry. I know it's too fast. Questions? Um, it wasn't clear to me in the privacy thread model, you talk about the web adversary. Is that the web server, uh, an arbitrary web server, or is it the provider of the, of the verifier? Or? It, what, what we mean, we don't look at the, uh, the implementation. We look at the, the spec of the protocol. It can be any web attacker, which means the difference between web attacker and network attacker is the, at the end. The web attackers at the end, they have the signature. However, the network attacker can have like all the interaction between the user and the server. But can you give me an example of a web attacker? Would it be a, a web server, for example? Or? Like, for, say I'm a user and you are the server and I'm trying to connect to you. So I send yeah. you at the end my signature. This is the web attacker. You have the signature, and you're gonna try to read it. However, the network attacker we mean. So you're gonna send me the challenge in the beginning, and, I'm, and the network attacker will save this challenge, and then I'm gonna send you another information, and then. But the web attacker cannot access all this um, information between us, but he can only access to the result of the interaction. But why isn't the web attacker the part of the interaction? Because it's going to see at the, at the end the result and then it's try to see if the, if the two signatures are linked or not. So it doesn't care, what, it doesn't care what's the interaction between me and the server. It cares like, oh, I have the signature now and it's saved in my server or the server I'm accessing to. And I want to see if these two users are the same or not. But the network attacker, does he have access to an encrypted communication? Encrypted? Or unencrypted? No, we use encryption. So how can they see challenges if it's Like in, for example, the offline... Well, the network adversary. For example, the authentication can, can, for example, can he change the message and the, and the user cannot know if the message is changed. And still, the, the server, for example, will still authenticate the user even if the message is changed. And this protocol prevents us from this. You see? Like the attacker, in Proverive, in the VR model, the attacker can change the message or can inject a new message, but cannot change the result of the encryption. So for example, when in the case where I have uh, here, when for example the relying party would send the loss, what if the attacker would change the loss and send another loss or another challenge? Will the authentication still hold or not? And this is wrong. It, I mean, the web authentication protocol will prevent us from this. However, in the, the web attacker, we don't change the messages. We just look at them, at the attacker, just look at the messages and see if can link these two signatures. It's a bit strange that the, the web adversary, who's like the party you interact with, that is a passive adversary? It can be active, passive, but can be you say they only look at the information, but they cannot change it. So that's passive, right? In the you web attacker? The web adversary? No, it can't change it. But what he, for our like definition of privacy, we don't care about if he changed the signature or not. We care about if he actually would know that there is one user behind these two signatures. But for authentication, we actually see if he can change the message. Like, for example, in this case, the relying party will send the challenge, and then the attacker, which is an active attacker, will change the laws. Does the protocol prevent us, prevent the user, or oh, he will realize that the message is changed and cannot authenticate because there is an attacker in the middle? A few slides later, we have uh, run throughs of the prover. 
-hmm. here. Could we, could we go step by step or maybe understand more? This is just uh, the result. Uh, I so suppose it explains how to uh, what's it called? how to contradict the horn clause. You know? Are we seeing a sequence of things that need to be that, that show how it goes to the result? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I didn't put them, but uh, I think I have them on my laptop. Usually, for example, the first part, like before the red box, is uh, the top or bottom. Oh, uh, this is just for uh, yeah for the first for the first okay. part. Starting query not attacker and result not attacker is true, which means that the attacker, which means the attacker is attacker at the station secret key is false because it's too wrong. Because it's about authentication, right? At all. No, the first two lines is about integrity, which the result, result of the attacker at the station secret key, the at the station secret key user is, uh, is true, which means the result attacker at the station is false, which means the attacker actually couldn't access to the secret key because, in, in a, I mean, we put it on the secret key, but we also put it on the public key, and because it was encrypted, this is why the attacker couldn't access to these messages. And the second part, after the result, it's query event. Now, the in all faces of the, do you see where I'm talking? Yeah, the third row, I think. Yeah, I'm talking to the third line. And now it's going to be the authentication. And it means the uh, sent, valid, sent challenge response, we put it on the process of the user. And then valid challenge response, we put it on the process of the server. It, it's linked to what you explained earlier, what, yes. the, what the events. So proving for the wrong, yeah, proving for run like uh, the model so many times, and uh, the process of the user and the process of the server will run in parallel. And in all cases, if in all cases the event send challenge response trigger directly, event uh, ch valid challenge response, it means the authentication hole. Is this intuitive, or I would expect that the uh, valid user authenticates one of those events will happen at the end of the protocol? I seem to remember you said that at any stage it can directly... Not, not in any stage, in any um, uh, run. run of the protocol, yeah. In, uh, in every run? In every run of the protocol. Basically, the like the attacker will try a lot of like er, trying to inject messages or change the messages. If it, all the branches of the horn clauses cannot do this, which means the authentication hole. How do you know if you're looking at all possible scenarios? How do you know you have completeness? In probability. Yeah. 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 The result you can see it like you can see the. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have put them in the slide, but it, it's really long file. So you, you can see like all the the branches and all like um, by number and how like for example the attacker has this key and it's like it's a binary it's like a tree so for example like the attacker will have the I didn't say the at the issue public key and then he will change it and then he will put it like whenever we're gonna use it then and then it's gonna be like a tree until see like if the authentication holds or not. So it really is impossible that there is. Oh yeah, probably if if you put something right it's. It's right. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, but the problem with proof is if there is one tiny mistake that in the real world it's not going to happen, but probably will not show you this. It's like, yeah, for example, the authentication will not fall, just like in the case of like the attacker, like a really tiny probability. But if, if, it, uh, if it's 100% true, then the uh, probability holds. Of course, it's it's based on the assumption that the encryption really has the properties yes. you've programmed in, and every other primitive has the, pro the properties that you've programmed in. Yeah, and stuff like nonce, you know. It, I suppose you define nonce as nobody can guess it, whereas the prob there's a probability yeah. two to the minus whatever of it being guessed, but it's assumed to be non. Yeah. So acceptable. And is it a, a theorem prover which also works by you you query you you ask the question you want from it yes. by formulating it in the negative, and then the prover tries to deduce a contradiction, an internal contradiction in the set of statements. Yeah. So by reduction. Yeah. Yeah. This is why usually it's 
when I started it, I'm like, oh, it's true, but it's actually false, which all the queries are going to be negative. More questions? How big is the source code of modeling? Uh, this first part, I'm sorry, the, this first part, this is before GAA. So now we're working on GAA, and GAA is really long. This is, I think, it's one like 200 lines. It's not that big, it's just like how you implement it. Do you this. have a, a lot of layer of like a library where you define properties of crypto primitives? No, no. Those are in a library of Prograph. Okay. So Prograph is dedicated to crypto and security protocols. Yeah. So the 200 lines were just web auth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I think so. I think it was like 200, maybe a little bit less, but just this protocol, this model. What's that? Uh, it seems like you have only considered the uh, what's it called the the attack scenario between the Fidel Adam killer and the, the wire party. But have you considered the, the case where the attacker tries to get the user password or biometrics, you know, on the device itself? Because then it doesn't matter what uh, uh, what crypto you use in the uh, for signing the challenge. Once you compromise one's password to unlock the uh, private key, then none of the security claims hold here. So in this web authentication, it's, the spec chooses the key, it doesn't use uh, the PIN number or the digital biometric ID, which only uses the YubiKey device or your phone. And in this case, the issuer, which is, for example, YubiKey.com, will give you the attestation keys. And this is why, uh, I'm not sure you're, is this your question or? Yeah, if, if, if you consider only the, uh, the, the case where the uh, artifact is the UBK, then it's a different story. But uh, I, I think uh, it's not really important for the attack. A lot of us want to, when we use uh, our devices to log into uh, our banks, for instance, we do use pins. And uh, yeah. it's a local authentication, not uh, online, it's offline. And uh, it could be, uh, it's going to be. Uh, yeah, I agree, but in the spec, I mean, uh, if you look, I don't have internet, but if you look on the spec of W3C, like, they don't talk about the local, but they don't talk about biometric ID or PIN. It's maybe a suggestion that it's not mandatory. The, the authenticator, like, the authenticator attestation keys are the mandatory by default. Yeah. 